Welcome to the Fantasy Football Forge. My name is Steve, and we are at Mock Draft 2.0. 1.0 came out really successful. Thank you, everybody, for watching that, liking new subscribers. Much, much appreciated. There are some uh, quick mock drafts, if you haven't noticed, that you could watch that came out recently. And hopefully this one will be um, as enjoyable for you as the first. I will be doing this in two parts. I'm going to go over the first round in this video and then I'll follow it up with the second and third rounds in part two, probably a couple of days after this video comes out. I, I'm i not sure if this will come out on Friday or Monday yet, but I'm thinking it's going to be Monday, Wednesday. Puts a bit of a time crunch on to getting a 3.0 out. Don't want to flood your feeds with stuff. Um, so with that, I think I'll do a quick mock over the weekend where I'm going to look at if, if this Packers trade doesn't happen prior to the draft and see what kind of uh, impact that might have on the draft as well as some other factor. That's really what I've been doing with the quick mock drafts is just looking at what if we're wrong about this in general, how might that impact the draft? So um, that's ultimately what all of these are, is just kind of looking at different scenarios that the draft could go in. And um, with that, I think let's just get on with this. Uh, spent a lot of time on this, so hopefully you like it. Let's get on with, first of all, before the trade, the Aaron Rodgers trade happening here. And so what I have is um, a trade that I saw has some weight behind it. I believe there was a source close to the situation that kind of said this is what it's looking like currently, something like this. So uh, it is the New York Jets giving for Aaron Rodgers. I'm going to give the second pick in this draft that they acquired for Elijah Moore, followed by a fourth round pick, pick 112. This might be a little easier for everybody if there was a third round pick from the New York Jets here, but they just don't have that. Then we, uh, the Packers would have a conditional pick here for 2024. Could be as high as a first round pick, second round pick, or as low as a third round pick, depending on how, how the team does essentially in uh, 2023. So I just have it as kind of the most likely scenario, I would say, would be uh, that the Jets do make the playoffs as being a round two pick. Then as a bit of a security blanket because of the potential retirement of Aaron Rodgers after 2023, in 2025, the um, Packers would have a conditional pick going to the New York Jets, a third round pick, if Aaron Rodgers were to retire after 2023. Otherwise, that's off the table. And everything's all good if he plays in 2024. Uh, I think this makes a lot of sense for everybody. I like it enough, and uh, it, it feels like it's not too much, and uh, it, it's about in the right spot. So we're going to go with that trade, and then we are going to start the draft. And at 1.1, I am going to go with Bryce Young here for Carolina. I, If nothing else, it's um, at least something a little bit different, although it's starting to become a bit of the norm here with Carolina ultimately determining, deciding that um, they're going to go with Bryce Young, the best quarterback of the draft, at least coming into the draft, the best quarterback. Um, another quick note here, sorry about, I, I this should be better audio than in my more recent quick mock draft. I just moved places, as you can uh, see the empty wall behind me, and um, I don't know how much of it is the new recording area, how much of it is just me having something a little bit different with the setup here. Um, but I, I'm not loving the audio currently. I just did some different things to it. Hopefully it's better. Um, it, it was in a test. So I, I do apologize, though, if the audio is slightly annoying or anything like that. Now let's go on to the second pick of the draft. And we're not going to go crazy here with um, this, you know, trying to be somewhat predictive uh, still following my board to some extent, but also not doing a what would I do draft. This is just kind of a mix of a potential way that I think this draft could go with um, my thoughts on everything and what I've gathered from other people. So um, Houston, uh, I think, would be very intrigued in the prospect of drafting Anthony Richardson if Bryce Young were to go at number one. But I think ultimately... Um, even though that ceiling is super enticing for Anthony Richardson, Houston cannot afford to potentially miss on this draft pick. And so they go the safer route with CJ Stroud. 
not as high of a ceiling, um, probably the highest floor of the main guys coming out of here. Then Arizona comes up on, and according to reports, there are six teams that are trying to move up to this number three pick for Arizona. And of the teams that you know could potentially be coming up, uh, I wouldn't write off Seattle or the Lions or both of them being involved in that conversation as of the time that that report came out. Now, that report came out prior to uh, the Lions trading away Jeff Okuda, and I think that that would take the Lions out of the running for this uh, quarterback, you know, going up to the number three spot to secure Anthony Richardson or Will Levis, uh, because I think that that trade signifies the fact that they're going to go cornerback in this first round at pick six or <clears throat> or elsewhere in the first round. But if they were to trade up, then they're going, you know, second tier cornerback. And, and to me, I just think that the Lions are out of it at this point if they were in it in the first place for this number three pick. And that would leave the door wide open for Seattle. And nobody's going to beat Seattle out if Seattle decides that they want this pick. Works for Arizona. They drop the least distance compared to other teams, compared except for Indianapolis. But uh, Seattle could outbid Indianapolis for sure here. And that's what I'm going to end up having happen. So I do have Seattle coming up for this pick, giving the fifth and the 20th pick here. It's it's a little bit much. Now, you could give them back pick 66, but there are other teams that want in on this you know spot. So Arizona kind of holds the cards here, but Seattle is able to get pick 96 back in return because this is quite rich just to move up to pick three, uh, a little bit at least. So... This is a possible trade scenario here if Seattle wants to do this. But in, in this universe, in this mock draft, that is how I have it happening. Uh, sometimes this trade goes through. It seems like every other time uh, I have a couple trades in here that may or may not go through. But I do research the value of the trades uh, every single time. So th they all work value-wise according to a couple of different trade charts. Now, as far as uh, Seattle goes, obviously they are coming up here to take Anthony Richardson and get their future started. They still have quite a few capital over the next two years in order to stay relevant and s still try to win right now with Geno Smith, but just get things rolling on the future future because, um, I mean, I, I don't think it's Geno Smith for the long term. And I don't know that Seattle's totally sold on it because how they structured Geno Smith's deal is that they have a, an out here uh, even after this one year with Geno. So um, it, it wasn't some sort of uh, they're locked into Geno for three years type of deal. They can definitely still get out of that or, or they could stick with Geno while they develop Anthony Richardson for two years, three years would work as well. Another thing here with this trade that I was doing, I did look heavily into moving instead of that third round pick from Arizona back to Seattle, moving uh, Hopkins in with that deal. And uh, ultimately it, it, there was just too many reasons for that deal not to come together to make it happen in here. But I do think that that is possible if Seattle wants to make that happen, it, it definitely could be done there. Let's move on to Indianapolis. And I doubt that all six of those teams that were talking with Arizona wanted a quarterback. So if Indy wants to move back, I do think that that would be possible. However, I don't think that they want to move behind the Raiders, and I don't think that Arizona cares to move up this one spot. So that really leaves it up to Detroit. If Indy were to come to a deal with Detroit, is now they're going to risk Arizona trading back again for a team who wants to come up for Will Levis. So all the more risk there it would take Detroit having to overpay in order to move up for Indianapolis to feel comfortable moving back even just two spots here. And so I just don't think it works out for either team. And in the end, of course, Indianapolis grabs Will Levis. So we go quarterback, 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 quarterback to start the draft. And Arizona is up on the board at pick number five now. With having adding that pick 22 first round picks in this draft, Arizona can now afford to take a risk here that they otherwise might not have been feeling comfortable to do. And they're going to grab potentially the best player in the entire draft in Jalen Carter. It's that simple. It, it It's a risk for sure. But 
the upside is also very, very high. Now the Lions come up onto the board and you can never have enough pass rushers in this league and Will Anderson Jr. should be a great culture fit for Detroit as well. So we are going to go Will Anderson Jr. He can play at multiple spots along the defensive front and he is never a liability while he is on the field. He can help to stop the run when needed and he can also put pressure on the quarterback. Detroit gets a complete prospect here with Car without the uh, risk of going with Jalen Carter. That brings uh, Las Vegas up onto the board and Las Vegas has options and theoretically they could trade back from this spot. However, they have quite a bit of capital in this draft already, so I'm going to have them sticking and picking here. And it's between a cornerback and a defensive lineman. And I'm going to lean into Gonzalez and Witherspoon here as um, being higher on the big board for at least some teams. And obviously, uh, then Tyree Wilson, by the way. And so I have them going with Christian Gonzalez uh they could also be thinking Devin Witherspoon, but I have them going with the younger cornerback who, although he is less versatile, he is also more specialized as a shutdown cornerback for the Raiders. Now, there is an argument that we could make to go for Tyree Wilson. And to me, the, the biggest argument for that would be that uh, cornerback is potentially an even deeper position than edges in this draft. So you could play the who will be there at my next pick type of game and uh, determine that you would prefer having some sort of combination like Tyree Wilson and DJ Turner over having Christian Gonzalez and maybe BJ Ojulari or something like that with your next pick. And that brings Atlanta up onto the board and they're going to have a, a similar question mark here. Do we go cornerback or edge? And in this scenario, I, I do think that Green Bay Packers coming up to take Tyree Wilson would make sense. Um, they should have the ammo to be able to do that in this draft if they wanted to. But other than that, I'm not really seeing a whole lot of trade partners making sense here for Atlanta, especially with all the quarterbacks off of the board. And ultimately, I think that the Packers want to have both of those second round picks that they had. And their third round pick just probably would not be enough value for Atlanta to move all the way back. And although the Falcons would love to have Devin Witherspoon and Tyree Wilson on their team, they can only pick one spot. And ultimately, I think they're going to say that the, the trenches are more important than the back end of the defense. So I have Atlanta going with Tyree Wilson. He is a versatile and prototypical type of prospect. Uh, not the perfect prospect for sure, but a, a very good one in a decent edge class. He's number two. So uh, by on most people's boards, at least including mine, then Chicago comes up and it's, it's very simple here for Chicago. You have to protect your quarterback. The tougher question is, is do you go with the single best offensive lineman on the board? That being Peter Skaronsky overall offensive lineman or do you go with the single best pure tackle in Paris, uh, Johnson Jr.? I have heard arguments from people for needs at the tackle position for them, and I've heard arguments that they may be better serviced by looking at the interior. Ultimately, I'm going to go with the better pure tackle prospect in Paris Johnson. Personally, if it was my decision, I think I would go P uh, Peter Skronsky, but I've just... I think I've heard more people say that tackles in need than um, just interior guard. And then it depends on how Chicago views Peter Scrossi. Do they view him as a tackle, which I, I think he deserves a shot at, at the very least at this next level. But uh, that could also determine his value for teams. Ultimately, if they think he'll be successful at the tackle or not, then Philadelphia comes up onto the board and uh, Philly doesn't have a lot of draft capital in this Draft, I mean, they have a lot of high draft capital. What they have is really good draft capital, but they don't have a, a whole lot of picks. And Tampa Bay has very little capital that they are working with to play in this. However, I do have Tampa Bay coming to a trade here. And so uh, let me get the trade out. Pick 10 for 19, and then uh, Tampa is going to move up with pick 50 here to move up to pick 10 from nine spots back. I think there are very good reasons for neither of these teams to be interested in trading down slash up. However, if Tampa felt that Peter Skaronsky was worth it, now would be the time to go up and get him, I believe. Tampa could also be interested in Devin Witherspoon here. However, I have them taking the most versatile, high IQ technician along the uh, offensive line in Peter Skaronsky. 
And with that, Philadelphia is going to get to take five players in the first two days of the draft. And it's pretty sick. Now Tennessee comes up onto the board and we're going to have back-to-back trades. And ultimately, um, Tennessee is pretty bummed out about this scenario. That's why this is happening. And they are fielding phone calls from trees from teams looking to come up for either, I would think, Devin Witherspoon or JSN, Jackson Smith, and Jigba. In the end, I have New England winning the bid and taking the ultra-gifted, do-it-all cornerback. He's got that dog in him, and he's very versatile. And what are we giving up here? I'm going to give up pick 14 and pick 76 to come up, and they are going to take Devin Witherspoon here. He can come in on day one and improve this defense, and versatility is just kind of the uh, icing on the cake that I think that this coaching staff could definitely get the most out of take advantage of, plus he provides some extra special teams abilities that they very well could like. So very good prospect for um, a a need for New England to just shore up this defense a little bit more, and that brings up Houston onto the board. And I still think that Houston uh, will be happy with or they are excited about what they're going to be getting in last year's wide receiver pick in John Mechie, who uh, had cancer, had to sit out a year. Uh, they obviously would be more intimately knowledgeable about uh, where his progress is as far as is he going to come in day one and kind of be the prospect that they wanted or not. But I have them. I have that being the case. I really like John Mechie, so maybe I'm just being optimistic, whatever the case Uh, They really could use a spark on this defensive side of the ball. And I think that the best man for that job that's still on the board is going to be the edge rusher. uh, Where are you? Nolan Smith. He's an athletic freak. He is definitely a my guy. He plays physical and he can help in both the pass and the run. And he's also a versatile outside linebacker that they can squeeze everything out of under the tutelage of their new head coach and ex-NFL great linebacker D'Amico Ryan. So... Uh, really like that pick there for Houston. Good luck with that. Now, the New York Jets come up onto the uh, board, and it's it feels just like what I said about the Bears. It's quite simple. you got to protect your quarterback in Aaron Rodgers now. And they could go Anton Harrison, who may be more ready on day one as a pass protector, but I'm going to have them continue to think long-term here, just like they are thinking with that trade with Green Bay. Um, not Not, you know selling out too much for this Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers, and they're going to take the higher upside prospect in my number three offensive tackle, Roderick Jones. Roderick Jones is incredibly athletic. He finishes plays, and like I said, he has very high upside. This decision should help Brees Hall in the run game more than Anton Harrison would, and in turn, that will also help to keep the pressure away from Aaron Rodgers with that constant threat of the running game, not allowing the defense to really rear up their heels and just go for it. So I, I think it, it all equals out. You take the better prospect um, over Anton Harrison, who might be a better pass protector, which is why I've taken him for them in the past. Now Tennessee comes up onto the board for the second time, and for the second time, we are going to be trading. Uh, Tennessee was hoping to be able to scramble up in this draft up to anywhere from pick six to nine to get a quarterback, and that just uh, didn't happen. So with that out of the window, they find an opportunity here in Detroit to uh, acquire some future capital to make the magic happen for 2024 when there's going to be some really good picks. And so Detroit is going to pay up here because, as I said, I thought that Detroit was essentially out of the running here and traded Jeffrey Okuda away because they felt that they had a really good chance of getting a very good cornerback in this draft. And they need to make sure that that happens and ensuring that uh, by trading up with Tennessee here. Going to get rid of uh, round two here. They have some decent capital already for the future. Not going to have to give away their capital right now for just building this team to try and win now. And so I think it works out for everyone. uh, This didn't. Yeah, I think I made it pretty obvious what position we're going at, and it's pretty obvious who we're going for. And and that is going to be Joey Porter Jr. Because I just don't think that the Lions want to just leave some sort of dead spot on their roster after everything they've done. JPJ should be able to come in. He uh, should be a good fit for them culturally, just as well as Will Anderson would be. And his long arms and just his plus athletics and how he plays are going to bring some more physicality to the back end of this defense. And he should be able to make a few splash plays along 
uh, along the way here in year one as well. Two really good picks there for Detroit. Then the Green Bay Packers come up onto the board and edge would make sense here for them. Tight end would also make sense here for them. A small wide receiver like Jackson Smith Jigba would break every trend that we associate with how the Packers draft and how they've drafted for a long time now. And it would probably tear a hole in the fabric of the space-time continuum as we know it. But it could also make a lot of sense for them to get Jordan Love, an absolute security blanket that he can rely on. The team has a need in the slot, and JSN is possibly a once-every-few-years kind of guy due to his elite shiftiness, his excellent hands, and his top-of-the-line route running. Three things that the Packers could really add into that wide receiving core and um, and, and improve it. Jackson Smith and Jig was there. Um, I think the Packers should take him, and I think that they might. Now Washington comes up onto the board, and I, I hate trying to draft for Washington. I want everyone that's available while I same, simultaneously want to trade back to acquire more picks for them, and just nobody, no one pick feels right for them because they do have a, a plethora of needs to improve this team. But this guy feels like a great match for them. He's a highly athletic, physical press man corner, and that man is going to be the last cornerback of the, the big four in Deontay Banks. And that's going to bring the Pittsburgh Steelers up onto the board, and Pittsburgh's fans want the picket fence to be built. And in this mock draft, in this scenario, I have them trying to make that fence a nice, big, luxury privacy fence in the six foot eight, 374 pound right tackle with 37 inch arms. And he's not going to be up here because you don't love him, PFF. And that man is DeWand Jones. DeWand is an excellent pass blocker and he fits the Steelers' Steelers blocking scheme. So he's a good fit for them. And he's just the medicine that they need. It's a shame that he isn't more versatile, but in this scenario, uh, Pittsburgh knows exactly what they're going to be getting in DeWand, and they can focus on the rest of the offensive line while feeling comfortable with what they have at the right tackle. Or for you, it would be the right tackle, I believe. Now, Tennessee comes up onto the board for the third time in the draft already at pick 18, and they're going to trade. I'm kidding. They're not going to be trading back here. So uh, the cork has already been popped on the second tier of offensive linemen in this draft with uh, Dwan Jones going off the board. And Tennessee can wait a year for their guy to really develop and, and be a true, true good starter. Um, probably get him on the field this year. But it's a big issue for Tennessee that they really can't afford to miss on or ignore. So they wanted to give themselves the best opportunity to hit with this draft pick. And even though he may not be the most ready day one guy, Darnell Wright is going to be the man for them in this draft. Then Philadelphia comes up onto the board and there are a lot of fun picks for Philadelphia. Remember, they traded back here. Some of them could still be on the available for Philadelphia in 11 picks when they pick at pick 30. At least some of them may have someone like of similar value that would still be available at pick 30. However, there is one guy who there is nobody of similar value and who I don't think will make it to pick 30. And that is one of the better players in this draft, one of the best players, all, you know, just overall players in Brian Branch. I think uh, Brian Branch would make an excellent fit on this team. I think he fits, he addresses an immediate need, at least as far as Philadelphia goes, probably one of the biggest immediate needs that they have. And he can really do it all, and he should be an excellent fit on this team. So, Brian Branch, it is for Philadelphia. Then the Arizona Cardinals come up on the board, and I think that this board has fallen as nicely as the Cardinals could have hoped for when they traded back. I recently had Arizona taking this player in the second round because I think that he is more of a second-round prospect. But with Arizona not needing him to make some sort of immediate impact here in 2023, and with him being exactly what the coaching brass that has come over from Philadelphia has always looked for in Philadelphia, I think it would make a lot of sense here. He is my number seven edge prospect. However, he is many people's number three edge prospect, and that man is Lucas Van Ness. You pair him up with Jalen Carter that they got at pick five up here, and that front seven in Arizona just got a whole lot stronger very quickly. So I, I think that's a, a, an exciting first round there for Arizona. 
if they can, I mean, if they get two first round picks, it's probably going to be exciting no matter what, but you never know. The Chargers come up onto the board and I always hate this pick for the Chargers. It never feels like the right guys are available and it feels like I'm forcing a wide receiver to them when I really don't love the wide receiver options this season at this point in the draft value wise. However, this time around, I felt at peace very quickly when I thought to myself, what about Dalton Kincaid? And I, I just pulled the trigger. I didn't, I didn't overthink it at that point. I'm just like, yeah, it addresses the need of improving their tight ends position while simultaneously also adding a much needed receiving threat to this offense. So it, it killed two birds with one stone there, two birds in the bush. I don't know how that works. Then Baltimore gets up onto the board and Baltimore just went and got OBJ. So I'm not going to force a wide receiver to them. Just like I feel like I'd be forcing one to the Chargers if I went there. And the cornerback position, which they really would have loved, got ravaged already. And it's also pretty deep in this class. So there's no need to reach right now for Baltimore for that. Defensive line definitely could make some sense. But trading back and acquiring some extra capital could be very nice as well. The question is, who wants to be moving up at this point in the draft? I think a lot of the teams are going to feel pretty similar for the most part about kind of letting some of these position groups get to them. However, one position group has already um, uh, started popping, and uh, th this should become obvious what position the group that is with these teams. So I have uh, Cincinnati could want to come up here to secure a tight end. Jacksonville could also want to block that from potentially happening, thinking that they're going to be taking tight end at pick 24 here. If they're thinking, you know, if, if they're thinking ahead of themselves in Jacksonville, they might kind of catch wind of that when they're trying to make a trade up here with Baltimore. And in this scenario, Baltimore would only have to move back a couple of spots to Jacksonville. So that gives a little added motivation to to trade with Jacksonville instead of Cincinnati, which is, I think, what Baltimore would like to do. They still want to get some good high, high talent. But if they can uh, get a little bit more capital in the draft along the way, that's all the better. So I do have um, I, I ended up having Jacksonville Jaguars win out this trade, moving up two spots and Baltimore is going to get pick uh, 19 in the fourth round, pick 121 there out of this. Nothing too bad. It doesn't cost much for Jacksonville, and Baltimore gets to take one more crack at a portion of the draft where I think that there still will be some solid names left at, uh, up till like the 150s or so. I haven't quite done the math yet. With that, I think that Michael Mayer makes a lot of sense for Jacksonville. He is solid as an all-around prospect, so where are you, Michael? And he really doesn't have any weaknesses and he should be able to get up to speed quite quickly for Jacksonville. He can help to keep Trevor Lawrence safe and he can also give him a relief valve to throw to. In the year 2023, I think that he can kind of uh, focus on the blocking early while getting taught by learning through example, if nothing else, from Evan Ingram in the receiving game. And you know, just focusing on being kind of that in-line tight end and keeping Trevor Lawrence safer early on in two tight end sets. And then as the year goes along, as everything starts to come together for Michael Mayer midway later season, then they can start to open up the playbook and get him involved in the passing game more and be that extra threat down the playoff stretch. And hopefully for, you know, just be the guy who puts him over the edge for a Super Bowl later in the season. So like that pick for Jacksonville. Now let's move on to Minnesota and I don't know that the value is quite there for some of the bigger needs for Minnesota at this point in the draft, kind of similar to how I felt for Baltimore. But there is one potential need that we are quite possibly overlooking as a draft community that the Vikings might think is important, and that would be at the running back position. That This was uh, bigger news earlier on in the offseason, uh, January time period, as a possibility because of uh, contract situations, but um, if the if if Minnesota is not interested, this would be a good spot for them to trade back if they are able to. If they are interested, which I have them being, 
in this scenario, they can take one of the best players in this draft by far at pick 23 and continue to just have a rock solid running back for years into the future in Bijan Robinson. The Vikings are in this kind of mini rebuild where, you know, they probably overachieved last season. And frankly, this um, may not be the best draft class for them to get some of the bigger needs that they need to fill at pick 23 based on how this draft has fallen so far. So best player available it is with Bijan Robinson. There are moves that the team can make yet with Delvin Cook that aren't going to hurt them too much financially, or they could just um, have a beastly duo coming out of this backfield. I think that Bijan Robinson matches this offensive system better than Delvin Cook. Remember, Delvin Cook was from the previous regime, but uh, Delvin could still stay and, and pound the rock. He can still do that very well, especially if you're able to keep him fresh when they need to and just have Bijan as your, um, yeah, just a split backfield in general there. Now let's get on to Baltimore. And I was actually exploring Baltimore going Bijan Robinson, another dark horse team that would definitely surprise if they went running back, but it could also make some sense for them. And that said, uh, Bijan's off at the table, so that makes this pick easier. And I'm very tempted to go interior defensive line with Brian Brzee or Clyde Jacansi still on the board. But in the end, I settled on a freakish, good charactered Miles Murphy, who they can definitely find a spot for on that defense, no problem. Then the New York Giants come up onto the board and sit down, Giants fans. I almost always give you uh, a center. And or have them like trade back and still take a center. But it's a new day here in the fantasy football forge. So rejoice, Giants fans. I have mocked you a receiver who some may love and others may hate in Quentin Johnston. The hope is that he'll bring a new element to this offense that despite many wide receiver additions this offseason may be able to help open this offense up. If things work out with Quinton Johnston, it's probably worth it at this point in the draft, especially for New York. Then the Dallas Cowboys come up onto the board, and the question is, who does Dallas like more? Is it Clyde Jacansi or is it Brian Brzee? And if I had to guess, Jerry Jones would like the extra flashy factor, the X factor that Clyde Jacansi has uh, compared to, not that Brian Brzee doesn't have some of that, but Clyde Jacansi is like the shiny tool, the shiny pick in this draft. And so um, that's that's what we're going to do here with Jerry Jones making that call. With that, the Cowboys address a need that uh, signs definitely point towards the team attempting to address in this draft early on. And Kalijah at his best could be an absolute disruptor, potentially on the lever level of someone like Aaron Donald, near. I have my concerns for Clyde Jacansi personally, but the potential is going to be too much for every GM to overlook. So although this is not necessarily a decision I would make, it's not a bad decision. And um, there you go. Get a disruptor there. Need for Dallas. Then Buffalo at one pick 27 here is uh, very interesting for them to trade back. It's also tempting for them to go ahead and take a guy to help in the front seven on the defense. Brian Brzee and Mozzie Smith to help shore up the front line. They could get Jack Campbell to address a hole in the middle of this defense. However, with how offensive linemen were flying off of the board earlier, I think that the decision makers will be relieved to see one of the top guys on their board still around. And that is uh, Anton Harrison here. He isn't great in the run blocking game, but since when have the Bills had a good rushing attack? So we're just going to go another year without really focusing on uh, improving that, I guess, here too much. And this should help to keep the pocket clean for Josh Allen. And that should really be priority numero uno. So Anton Harris, and it is Cincinnati is up onto the board, and with two tight ends off the board already, I don't think that Cincinnati has the luxury of even thinking of trading back at this point. It's going to be my number one tight end prospect here in Darnell, Washington, going to Cincinnati. Darnell can help to protect Joe Burrow. He can fill the hole that they have left with at the tight end position, and he should be a mismatch nightmare on third downs and in the red zone at the very least. This dude is an absolute beast. And I think that he has Hall of Fame potential. The downside is he does not have Hall of Fame production. 
and he's just an additional offensive lineman on the field, essentially. The upside in the passing game, the what could make him a Hall of Famer potentially, is all projection. It's not really a known factor of his game, and in fact, some people would say that um, it's, it's very likely that he, because of a lack of um, greatness in the receiving department, he may just end up getting moved to being a, a tackle in a year or two down the road. Um, it's possible. It's possible. I, I think he wouldn't be my number one tight end if I thought that was the case, but um, that's the reality of him as a prospect. There's upside to it and there's downside to it. Now the New Orleans Saints come up onto the board, and I have Mozzie Smith higher on my board than Brian Brzee. So you could be just as happy about this pick or happier in in the real draft if the Saints go for Mozzie Smith over Brian Brzee here. However, this is not a what I would do mock draft. It's a mix of all things, and in this case, I understand why a team would go for Brian Brzee over Mozzie Smith. The ceiling for Brian is higher than Mozzie's ceiling. Thus, I'm going to have the Saints going for that ceiling in Brian Brzee. Now let's go on to Philadelphia, and Philly certainly loves their freaks along the defensive line, and they love to keep a good rotation going there. And Mozzie Smith fits the bill, so that's where I'm going to have them go. The Eagles absolutely love their pocket pushers, and that's exactly what Mozzie Smith is. They have several guys along the defensive front who may not be around for a whole lot longer, so this also keeps the pipeline going. He and Jordan Davis up front in a year or two could be absolutely nasty. And, you know, what kind of nasty? I'm talking about the good kind of nasty. And that brings up the Chiefs, their last pick of this video. Remember, I will have rounds two and three come out uh, two days after this is released. I think Wednesday of, um, I don't know, what would that be, like the 19th? And, uh, yeah, gosh. Maybe even the 18th. Maybe I'll just release them in back-to-back -back days. Probably do that, so that way we get a little bit of a break before I release the 3.0. So uh, Kansas City here up on the board, and I'm sitting here with Kansas City looking at the board, and I, I want to trade back as their GM. I'm not getting any offers on PFF. Uh, as you can see, the zero there, that was true when I made this draft. So I what I did is I just started looking back. I can't scroll back anymore here. But you can see, I just started going back on the, the picks and like, is this team interested in coming up? Is this team interested in coming up? And none of them really were all the way down to the Green Bay Packers, who I do think is interested in moving up, and they definitely have that ammo. So um, I'm not sure that Kansas City wants to be moving all the way back to pick 42, even though they do want to move back. And I'm not sure that Green Bay really wants to move up this far, but sometimes when you can guarantee that you get your guy, you're willing to pull the trigger. So the Packers and the Kansas City Chiefs are talking in this scenario, and I have the Packers offering pick 42, so to move up, and uh, no, and a, th a future third round pick in 2024, which is fair value. PFF, if I were to go offer trade, does accept it, at least they did when I did it, and the trade charts like it. But I think that Kansas City says the only way that this is going to work is if you get me a future second round pick. The thing is, Green Bay still gets to keep their capital this year. So this is enticing, but it's a little bit rich to them because they do want to keep this, ta this capital. They don't know if that's going to work for other teams after this that they were looking to trade up with. And so they have a deal working around with that. So they come back to Kansas City and they say, look, you have a deal if... We can get pick 178 from you. That's the first pick of the sixth round for our highest seventh round pick there in pick 232. And Kansas City says, I suppose that's fair. They come to a deal there. And so tight end is a big time need, need for the Packers now that they are up on the board. And Sam Laporta is an excellent scheme fit. So that is the my guy. He is, um, I, I believe he would be one of the my guys on the Packers board. And they have the draft capital to make it happen in order to assure that they get one of their my guys, which he's not the only tight end who I think is up there, but I'm sure Sam is still on that list of targets. And with three tight ends already gone, the Packers just do not want to risk it. It would cost them 
less to move up to a spot like um, I, I, th I thought Indianapolis would have been a good trade partner for them uh, to move up and get that tight end before there's a couple of teams who might go tight end and it would have been a little less expensive, but they might not have been able to keep, you know, their current capital in trading with some of those teams. So this worked out for them. Plus, they were able to improve, you know, one of their seventh round picks, make it into a sixth round pick. Sam has great hands. He runs his routes well, and he can win at all three levels of the field. And he does his best to block well. He does have some issues with contested catches and holding on to his blocks when he's blocking. But hopefully those can get cleaned up. Other than that, he is an excellent prospect, and as I said, he is a great system match for the Packers. They've used their capital to go up and, and get their guy here. So as I said, uh, rounds two and three should be coming out. I guess, I guess I decided on tomorrow, and look forward to those. I will go through those at somewhat uh, the same pace as this, at least the second round. I have it all written out to go through at the same pace. I'll probably clean through that to make the, the length ultimately be about the same length as this video. Maybe 10 minutes longer is all I'm looking for. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, check out, obviously, uh, the, the second and third round. I should put up a card for that once that video's out. So thank you. Like, subscribe if you will. Just remember if you subscribe, uh, if you're not into fantasy football, like turn off the notifications. So then I'll be there next year for you this time of year or, or unsubscribe. I don't want you to, but I totally understand that uh, probably be some unsubscribers if you're not into fantasy football uh, after this season, because that is the focus, you know, eight months out of the nine, nine, 10 months out of the year on this channel. All right. Peace out.